to everyone who presented today and said they were nervous. Me too. <laughs> In part because, I mean, I know a lot of, one of the best things about coming to a symposium that Shelley Streeve organizes is that you know that it's going to be a cool space, meaning um, it's going to be a, an invitation to workshop newer work um, and that everyone's just going to hold you and be here for the conversation rather than try and perform some sort of mastery. And so, oh, there was an interesting moment, actually. Um, Kill. Kale, who, who like uh, leaned over to me during <laughs> uh, our panel presentation, and was like, "Hey, what's what's with all the reading, uh, the reading of papers, right?" <laughs> and I realized this is coming from a scientist who probably is used to going to conferences, and the presentations are all just slides and talking, yeah. And I realized, oh, what a funny thing to re to. And I leaned back over. And I said, "There are a lot of folks from literature here," and in a way, like the text and the paper and the word and the sentence is our data. And uh, so it, it's an interesting moment to kind of, for me to think through as I'm myself trying to move my practice from reading papers to talking off slides, uh, that makes me nervous, um, that to think about the way we hold our relationship to um, the data. Um, so my performance will be a little speculative today, and I also want to recognize that we're running a little late on time and that we really want to get to dinner and all those things and people are tired. So um, it may appear, I, I was ner nervous mostly because I knew that the folks in the room, um, many of you may have seen me uh, give a version of this talk um, over the past, I realized, two years. <laughs> um, and for the past couple of years, um, I've been thoroughly captivated by, but also more than just a hair suspicious of, a new movement toward building artificial reefs to answer the climate change related phenomena of ocean acidification, coral bleaching, and the death of corals around the world. I first came across this mo movement when succumbing to a piece of Weather Channel clickbait, honestly, which introduced me to a Smithsonian and National Geographic hyped art project called the Underwater Museum. So Jason DeCares Taylor, whom Kill called a prick, which was, okay. um, that's now on record. Uh, <laughs> I, if nothing else, I totally, I, I felt, I feel so affirmed having come to this conference because I feel like you're the first person I've met who can like corroborate what I'm about to say. <laughs> um, so Jason DeCares Taylor is a sculptor using pH neutral cement, grooved and textured to allow coral polyps to attach and the sites are placed down current from natural reefs, facilitating this like proliferation of purple sponges, staghorn coral, red coralline algae, which some of you um, lit nerds might recognize as the cover to Ariel's ecologies. Um, uh, what do I need? Uh, uh, which this, sorry, oh my God, my sentences don't even make sense anymore. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, red coralline algae, which form the palette and textures the artist uses to embellish the structures. And in this case, the artist may very well include the ocean itself. Um, Taylor's work is arresting. It's beautiful, compelling, but it has also triggered a suspicion in me, not only about what it might mean to occupy the, set, the ocean floor, but more broadly, the seductions of an idealized commons that does not engage with histories and material consequences of settler colonialism. So Taylor has been writing and speaking about his work in TED Talks, predictably, et cetera, as being site specific. Um, it's specific to these locations, Grenada, Cancun, the Bahamas, the Canary Islands, as well as the Thames River, uh, where he has recently placed the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Um, Businessmen and bankers astride not horses, but oil extracting beasts modeled on nodding donkeys. These figures of extractive capitalism seem to be in a precarious position as Taylor subjects them to tidal forces that put them nearly underwater. Right? In these sculptures, there reside some legibly lefty politics that align well with the message of the Occupy Wall Street movement um, and their call to redistribute wealth and resources more equitably. But as Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang point out, in decolonization is not a metaphor, hashtag Occupy, oh, wait, one more, okay. Hashtag Occupy is really a, a reoccupation and the redistribution of wealth the movement calls for abides a population calculus 
that disremembers histories of genocide and ongoing forms of slow violence that fall beyond the scope of policymaking that orients itself towards a majoritarian population, relegating indigenous people as statistically insignificant. Are Taylor's underwater sculptures another form of reoccupation? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I think it's ultimately kind of a red herring question. What I find myself most wary of is the potential for a kind of smug liberalism to take up the broader work of reef building without divesting from the investments and practices that led to reef death to begin with. So I suppose you could say in the language um, uh, of the recent ASA conference theme that I'm wearing of wary of building for the sake of building rather than building while fighting. So um, green capitalism looks, and a lot of people have written about this, um, looks to blasted landscapes as the material to feed right back into development projects that sustain rather than intervene in this like fantastical drive toward consumption without end. So to analyze how this recycling of capitalism works, Jasbir Poir's formulation of a regenerative productivity proves helpful, or at least it has to me. Um, Those folded into life, writes Poir, are seen as more capacious or on the side of capacity, while those targeted for premature or slow death are figured as debility. And while debility is profitable to capitalism, in the in the sense that uh, we have we create disposable labor populations, et cetera, et cetera. So is the demand to recover from or overcome it. So one thing that I'm trying to do here is bring disability justice um, conversations um, together with environmental justice conversations. And some queer disability justice thinkers, such as Eli Clare, the Sins Inv- Invalid um, Collective, Alison Kafer, Leah Lakshmi, Piepsna Samrasinha, have already problematized a drive towards cure that primarily fuels techno utopianism and biomedical positivism. They insist instead on a turn from cure to care, which interrupts the demand for fixing to think critically about the normative and ableist frameworks that entrain people toward the elimination, the violent elimination of difference rather than the holding of deviance as a potentially radical site for world building. So what I'm trying to do here is ultimately position um, or think through a a critical history of environmentalism as one that might be understood as both a settler environmentalism and one that was already invested in sustaining um, an ableist notion of the environment. In other words, like positioning um, setting up environmental remediation efforts as yet another way for, de- to, for development to profit doubly on environmental degradation. So let me take you through a couple of these arguments. Um, okay, so I have to like switch platforms here for a second. Um, how do I, okay, I'm gonna do that. And then I have to do this, which risks, I didn't, (laughs) don't look at my email. (laughs) I had this up earlier in the the correct way. Okay, here. All right. Um, So here is just an Atlantic um, photo essay by um, Alan Taylor from 2011. It's been a minute. Um, Documenting all these various artificial reef projects around the world. And I really need some water. Hold on. <clears throat> because we're short on time, I'm just going to fast forward a bit through these. You should really go look it up, and you can probably pull this up on your screens right now. Anyway, but basically, what we have is a photo essay documenting all of these retired, decommissioned um, military uh, machines from aircraft carriers. Um, to tank, oh, see, there's Jason Takeras Taylor's work folded in there. Um, but I want, I really want to get to the pictures of the tanks. Ah, here we go. So 25 retired tanks from the Thai military are loaded on a ship at Bangkok Port, Thailand. Um, on Friday, July 30th, 2010, the tanks will be dumped into the Gulf of Thailand to serve as artificial reefs and as habitat for marine, marine animals. Bye-bye tank. 
There it goes. Um, the article, the Atlantic article makes an interesting, like spe specific move to call these, to call out these T-69 armored tanks Chinese made. And part of that was a hint to me about some of the politics undergirding um, the performance of these dumpings of um, tanks and military equipment into the ocean. It's not as if it's just happening and like, oh, we're going to repopulate the reefs. There's a real performance aspect here about the asking the press to come take pictures of it, to like celebrate something. And I'm wondering, I want to put, you know, I'm inviting you to think with me about this, about um, what exactly, what narrative we're setting up here. Um, and part of this is, of course, a story of the shifting um, military industrial complex ties geopolitically of Thailand from using U.S. tanks to using Chinese tanks. And so I think there's um, a lot of interesting things we can say about the framing of this photo essay in The Atlantic. Um, there's also New York City subway cars. Um, I mean, there's so many stories about buried and um, repurposed uh, military um, technologies here um, that are, are we supposed to understand this as like, if we just bury our military histories and like make them grow coral polyps, then is that like a move to innocence somehow? Is it an absolution? Is it a kind of baptismal move? Well, here's one answer from the same photo essay. So here, I'll just read the caption. Fish swim near a lion sculpture in the Neptune Memorial Reef. Tuesday, April 29th, 2008, 3.25 miles off the coast of Cape Biscayne, Florida. So creators of the reef hope it will become a memorial for the dead and a diving site. Instead of a burial funeral, people can pay to have their remains placed in one of the reef structures after their death. So this follows on the heels of the trend, the like hipster trend of like having your body buried by a tree and then you know, like the tree, you become the tree. And you know, <laughs> what's that? That's a thing. <laughs> that, that's a thing, Shelley. <laughs> it's very different from what Octavia Butler imagined to be acorn. <laughs> um, it's a thing and it's disturbing. And I, I, what, what kinds of stories are we trying to set ourselves up for here? It feels like a whole lot of moves to innocence to me. Um, here are all the tanks, more tanks. Um, is, was there one more that I wanted to show? No, it's just the spectacular nature of it all too that um, is already, already what sort of launched my, raised my hackles about Jason Takeras Taylor's work, which I should mention, Oh, okay, let's talk about material practices here for a second. So um, Taylor will go and visit various like island and tropical locations and kind of work with the community in the sense that he will ask and pay for locals to volunteer their bodies to be cast in plaster so that then these statues can be made. And um, there's a lot of celebration in his own photo book about the underwater museum, about how it captures all the scars and the pockmarks and the textures of these people's skin. And I think that there's something about environmental remediation going on here that seems really, really suspicious. Um, and I, I, I certainly um, think that there it sets us up for a kind of fetish, fetishization of um, miscelebrating the disappeared and invisibilized labor of, um, you know, this is the tricky move here. I mean, it's, it's the slipperiness of the text of both uh, slaves from the transatlantic slave trade, but also the displacement of indigenous peoples because his underwater sculptures were first, when they first started here, I'm gonna switch back to the PowerPoint slide, were first misunderstood by the public as being a memorial to slaves. So um, you can, it takes a second to switch over. So, I mean, there is, there's all sorts of interesting room to read against the grain here. Um, I'm very much interested in how the story how DeCaris Taylor's sculptures um, capitalize on um, the misapprehension of the sculpture's purposes 
And I really want to ask what he's memorializing in this, what I feel to be kind of a, a plaster, plastic form of, <laughs> it's not plastic, but there's something also about the continuity of the materiality of the cement um, and Rinnet Dome and the cement paving over that it tries to remediate and digest, but in, is undigestible, the you know plutonium infused soil. I, it's just, there's so much like potential for a reading of haunting and all that's all that good stuff. Um, but uh, what am I trying to do? Here, here's the thesis statement, <laughs> I guess you could say. Um, if, I got a really good paragraph. If environmental degradation tells us a story about, it, it becomes spectacularized in the media as this way that um, coral death becomes the canary in the coal mine, right, of um, planetary um, suffering. Um, somehow these artificial reefs and artificial islands are supposed to like deliver us and tell us the techno-utopian future of what's possible, right? It, it is speculating a speculative future of climate change. Um, however, it's of course like bearing in the process the history of militarization that brought us to this point to begin with. Um, and by militarization, I also mean global racial capitalism <laughs> and also, um, you know, the experimentation on uh, people's bodies of, you know, exploratory science, anyway, as it is related to military. Oh man, this is not how I wanted this to go. Okay. Um, the, all of this research began with um, a new story that I started uh, hearing about a while ago, um, which was about China's creation of artificial islands in the South China Sea, otherwise known as the West Philippine Sea, depending on where you're at, um, which involves pumping massive amounts of sand from the ocean floor onto reef systems in a land grab for this resource-rich archipelago and shipping lane, right? Um, it's a hotly disputed arena um, among Vietnam, Taiwan, the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei. Um, and it's not only an ecological, but also a military and financial incursion because you, some of you know the answer to this, but guess what the primary developments are on these artificial islands? Casinos and military bases together, adjacent, as if, as if they've been playmates for a long time. They have been, of course, speculate, financial speculation, land speculation, and now environmental speculation. Um, but the, oh my goodness, bong, pull it together. It's been a long month, really hard semester. Okay. Um, the, one of the things that I'm trying to pull out here is the, the way that environmental degradation might seem to set us up for all of these strategies um, to pour into um, the Green New Deal that might turn into development projects that might turn into like ways to techno utopianize ourselves out of environmental disaster. But the thesis here, you know, really borrowing on from Poir is that environmental degradation prepares the way for high profit margins for multinational capitalist development in the region under the banner of like green tech solutions, carbon offset funds. And it just seems as though we've witnessed so many adjacent examples of how capitalism is very adept at handling the narrative conversion of dying coral reefs um, and contaminated waters into sites of potential development. And so to bring, I was really lamenting the fact that I didn't present the more well-oiled piece of this um, version of this paper, which invokes um, the repurposing of genomics, the switch from mutation to regeneration, and is actually about nu nuclear proliferation because it would have gone so well with the other talks. But um, in the Marshalls, right, where rising sea levels are colliding with nuclear um, waste repositories, scientists are encouraging Marshallese to build artificial islands by blasting these coral reefs and dredging, right, and dumping the sand on top of the coral reefs. It is literally like the only chance at this point for Marshallese to stay in their land. What do you do? Who's going to pay for it? It's a billion dollar enterprise. It is, um, it is part, it is not, it was not part of the calculus of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Re, oh my God, come on. <laughs> remuneration, not remuneration. What, why am I, why is it so, why is it bothering me so much? Oh my God, my head. 
Okay. Um, it is not part of the package of, of giving back to the Marshallese to apologize for that. Come on, help me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Reparations. Thank you. Why so hard? Everyone's with me at the end of the day. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, okay. So um, on land, this process of, prepare, of preparing a region and an area for developers to come in and fix the depleted community. That's called gentrification, right? So what I'm trying to say here is that um, if you think through scholars, urban, urban study scholars like Craig Wilsey, um, who wrote a book called The Value of Homelessness, um, he writes about the actual, the predatory nature of urban development projects that um, capitalize on, on housing insecurity by first purposefully disinvesting from neighborhoods marked for gentrification by raising rents on public parks, grocery stores, laundromats, not to mention public education, to make way for privatization to come in and swoop in as the savior. So that gentrification looks like such a good guy, right? So what I'm trying to say through Taylor's Underwater Museum and through some of these um, artificial reef projects is that there seems to be a kind of gentrification of the sea, um, which is, I, I would just say, I would ask us to question the extent to which capitalism is all too prepared and ready to just say, yeah, the, the planet is totally effed. So guess who's going to come say to your rescue, you know? And I think that um, that in combination with um, Wang Yang's work on Occupy and moving from a commons to an under commons and really focusing on how um, redistribution is not repatriation of land, um, I think that there's something that we can start to think about in terms of the very settler framework of environmentalism that the international um, environmental managerial system has inherited. That is about management, bureaucratic redistribution, but not actually about changing fundamentally any of the things that got us into this mess to begin with. So in terms of like an alternative speculative future for climate change, um, my project is aiming to intervene in this kind of settler environmentalism to reimagine planetary futures through a kind of fugitive planning ethos. And what that really looks like, um, as has been iterate, reiterated so many times in this conference already, um, is to intervene in the elements of securitization, compartmentalization of how we legislate and regulate water, for example. Who thought that like looking regulating groundwater and um, like land use, we're going to be two separate enterprises, right? It's not as if what you do on land is not going to happen, is not going to seep into the aquifer below, right? Um, but so I, I feel as though that compartmentalization is part of the settler environmental framework that we're using. And what we really need to do to help decolonize some of that methodology is to go to deep reciprocity, to philosophies of interconnectedness, of being in relation that so many people have eloquently been discussing already today. Um, unsettling colonial logics, as uh, Kim mentioned earlier. Um, okay. I also think that interconnectedness, as Greg mentioned earlier, might involve a, a in connectedness across time. So this separation between past, present, and future, um, these tanks that are being pu pushed off the edge of you know, aircraft carriers um, to be repurposed as artificial reefs. Um, do they rely on practices of forgetting? Are they memorials? Or are they just like another nod to the way that futurity is being packaged through a, a misapprehension of what has happened in the past? So that is my messy talk, and thank you for bearing with me. <laughs>